It's the countdown to the British general elections on May 7th, and this is your weekly guide to the key discussion points of one of the closest electoral contests in a generation. Hello and welcome. This is The Road to Westminster 2015 with me, Amina Taylor. Now, with the opinion polls still showing a near dead heat between the two main political parties, David Cameron's Conservatives and Ed Miliband's Labour, politicians are squabbling over every vote. And one of the major political battlegrounds has become immigration. Once a staple of far-right groups, anti-immigrant rhetoric is being spouted by leading parties eager to prove Britain's borders would be safe on their watch. And it seems the concerns over immigration is fertile ground. A 2015 poll suggests nearly 80% of those who have been questioned think immigration levels need to be controlled. Anti-immigrant sentiments can feed into racism, but is there really cause for concern? Does the current political debate expose an ugly British on the belly? Faiza Ahmed reports. Fueled by the rise in popularity of right-wing parties and a global recession, the last few years have seen immigration become a controversial topic that is refusing to go away. It is also a highly divisive and politically charged issue being played out in the May elections. According to the Office of National Statistics, 624,000 people immigrated to the UK in the year ending September 2014. David Lammy is a Labour MP for Tottenham, a constituency that is considered to be one of the most diverse in London. Look, I think there has been pressure on the mainstream parties, including my own, to move to the right on this agenda, to play to the gallery, and not to make the positive case that overwhelmingly those that are arriving this country, either seeking asylum or because they're economic immigrants, are coming to contribute and do contribute and pay a lot more in than they take out. The government has suggested that much of the increase in immigration is due to EU citizens coming to live and work in the UK. This has become central to the far-right UK Independence Party's election campaign, who feel British people are suffering as a result. Over 10 years ago, Poland was allowed to join the EU, and as a result, many moved to the UK. Many members from the community feel that rather than being a drain, their contribution has been a gain to Britain. Um, I feel like I'm part of this place, so I try to contribute as much as I can. I work here, I enjoy living in here, and I try to do my best to actually be part of the community, not to isolate myself as well. It's, it's sad that they don't want um, Polish people, they don't want EU people to be in England, and uh, they think that we take the job from um, British. I don't think it's true. Experts are warning that an anti-immigration rhetoric is threatening to deepen social rifts. Now, according to a recent poll conducted, 76% of the population believes that immigration levels need to be reduced. Migration to Britain is nothing new. Throughout history, Britain has relied on migrants to build its economy, relying especially on those from former Commonwealth countries in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean. Migrants, which is my parents' generation that came over in the 60s, that came over, to, came over to build Britain up. You had the blacks, you had the Irish that were building Britain up. How could all the work that's been done by the migrants in this country be pushed aside and forgotten about just because of the new set that are coming? Scaremongering. That's how you do it. You make people terrified that Britain will not be British anymore because that statement in itself is quite racist when you say, keep Britain British. And that is the certain things that UKIP are pushing forward. They're pushing forward to say, we've got to keep Britain British but it weren't the Brits that actually built up Britain. They need to remember that. Politicians now have to decide if playing to gallery for short-term benefit will be what's best for Britain in the long run. Pfizer Ahmed, Road to Westminster. And today's show takes that immigration debate a step further. With all the main British parties talking tough on immigration, Home office buses urging illegal immigrants to go home, Labour coffee mugs promising to control British borders, and the United Kingdom Independence Party using anti-immigration as an electoral bedrock, it's never been higher on the political agenda. But our fears British politics is fostering anti-immigrant and racist sentiments, well really much ado about nothing. To try and answer that, I'm joined by Ben Quinney Harris. He's, of course, chairman of the Bow Group. They're the UK's oldest conservative think tank. 
And in addition to being the Bo Group's chairman, Ben's also the group's research fellow in international security and global affairs, as well as being a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. And alongside Ben is Rashid Nix. He's the Green Party's candidate for Dulwich and West Norwood in London. Rashid started his outreach and community work as a mentor and coordinator for Westminster's Race Equality Council's programs, and he's also keen to promote civic engagement and responsibility. He's the producer of the groundbreaking political film, Why Don't Black People Vote?, in which he tries to explore low voter turnouts to engage audiences of all races, ages in that discussion. Gentlemen, it's good to see you both here. I start off with that question, the talk about anti-immigrant sentiment, about racism coming from the political parties. Is it much ado about nothing, Ben? Well, I think actually there are, there are two uh, misperceptions there. The first is that there's a strong anti-immigrant sentiment in the United Kingdom. You mentioned figures of around 80%. 80% um, of people are concerned about the level of immigration that has occurred uh, into this country over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, I don't think that's quite the same thing as being anti-immigrant, because the vast majority of those people want to see some immigration, but think that the level of immigration is, has been too high. I think that's where the British people are on this issue. And, and the, the, the real fundament of concern about that is, is not economics, it's not relating to jobs, but it's the pace of cultural change that has occurred in, in, in some communities. And I think those concerns are, are perfectly valid, and it's, it's probably true that the level of immigration has been too high for um, widespread integration to take place. And both Jack Straw, the former Labour Home Secretary, um, and indeed the current Home Secretary, um, have both, of course, overestimated their ability to keep immigration to a level which would allow integration to, to take place naturally. And Jack Rashid, you would be standing as a potential uh, parliamentary candidate for one of the most diverse areas in Britain, when you're on the stumps, when you're speaking to people, are they telling you immigration is a problem in South London? Well, I would say, um, <coughs> pardon me, down in the uh, constituency of Dulwich and West Norden, which goes from Brixton in the north, as far south as Crystal Palace, taking in East Dulwich, immigration is not a topic that the people of South London are really concerned with because it's such a culturally diverse area You've got people from the Caribbean, from Africa, from South America, from Central Europe. Then you have the indigenous English people living amongst the, the same community. And people just seem to get on and do what they do. It, it seems like this, this idea of, of um, the, the immigration and the, and the cultural differences, um, and I can only go on anecdotal evidence, you know, as opposed to my colleague here who's into the hard research. And I was talking to a, um, a lady, an English lady, two days ago, and she said that she drove through Birmingham and she went down a street which was wall-to-wall -wall Muslims and it really upset her because there was ladies in hijabs and all the shops were selling you know, um, South Asian cultural produce. And she felt really strongly about this was no longer England. And I said, well, where do you live? Thinking that she lived in Birmingham. And she lived in Kent. So 200 miles away, the fact that there was an Asian community in Birmingham upset her so deeply and, and it really got me thinking like what part of the psyche are these politicians playing to when they talk about this whole immigration argument because were her fears based upon her love of Birmingham even though she come from Kent or was it based upon something far deeper than that which maybe you know maybe a psychologist can go into and uh, not a psychologist here Ben but the idea that there is something about the other that can be scary, that can be frightening. And perhaps Rashid's asking the question here, why would she be concerned? She's thinking, well, this is my country and I don't recognize it anymore. Would that be a fair assessment of what politicians have tapped into or is it just a cheap and easy vote winner? No, I think it is a fair assessment. And it's, it is, it's, it's far more serious than a vote winner when you've got 80% of the British public saying they're concerned. It, 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 at that point, it becomes the duty of political parties to address But if you're asking the them issue. the question, it's almost incumbent upon them to give you a positive answer. If they were asked, for example, a different question about then what should we do, 
We don't know the answer to that question. Well, as I say, if you're following I, I, I on think there that. are nuances here. And one of the important nuances is that I don't think the majority of British people are saying we don't want any immigration to the UK. It's that they're saying the level has been too high. Um, and I, I have no idea what, what this lady from, from Kent was most concerned about. She, but I, she was concerned with the fact that here was this street with people that didn't look like her, who had an who had a, um, Islamic culture, and her being a Christian, and even though I explained to her that a lot of these people were born here, they are British citizens, they might have um, an Islamic culture, but they're actually British citizens, had nothing at all to do with persuading her to see anything other than, it's not the England that I know, and I felt really frightened. That's, that, that fed into something else within her side. Well, well I, I, I think it, it, it's probably right to say that the concerns relating to immigration have been cultural. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's right that you've got what has essentially occurred in the United Kingdom, which is a bottom-up ghettoization. Which is fine, um, and we're going to touch on that because part of the bottom-up ghettoization argument is also a politician top-down discussion about what we should do. And we get back to this right after because the discussion about these elections is still so strong even though it's weeks away and it can feel to some of us myself included like it's a little bit of news overload but fear not we've selected some of the best talking points for you and Camelia Shambayati well she's bringing you this week's political news roundup On the 2nd of April, the leaders of the seven main UK parties took part in a live TV debate for the first time before polling day, clashing over issues such as immigration, the NHS and spending cuts. The Conservative and Labour leaders, as well as the leaders of the Liberal Democrats, the UK Independence Party, the Green Party, the Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru, also debated zero hours contracts and education. A poll by YouGov showed that the SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, came out as the winner of the debate on 28%, followed by UKIP's Nigel Farage. Farage argued that none of the parties were telling the truth on immigration and the European Union, and that only a vote for UKIP would, in his view, stem the tide of immigrants. Although he impressed in the debate, with 20% of the YouGov poll backing him as the winner, he courted controversy by saying that 60% of HIV-positive people in Britain are, quote, not British nationals, and implied that they therefore didn't deserve to receive NHS treatment, which would be costly. After Nicola Sturgeon's strong performance in the debate, she faced a media backlash, with one newspaper branding her the most dangerous woman in politics. Sturgeon also had to counter allegations in a leaked memo that claimed she secretly backed David Cameron over Ed Miliband, a claim she strongly denies. However, the prospect of Labour and SNP uniting forces to defeat the Conservatives is brewing, as Sturgeon offered to form an anti-austerity pact with Labour if they have the seats to defeat the Conservatives. There's been no official confirmation or denial of a potential UKIP Tory pact. Meanwhile, the Conservative Party responded to the threat of any Labour-SNP collaboration by posting this meme on their social media pages with the caption, Ed Miliband has once again refused to rule out a deal with the SNP. He would be in their pocket and hard-working taxpayers would pay the price. And you're back uh, with me and my guest, Ben Harris Quinney, who is chair of the Bow Group, and Rashid Nix, who's a parliamentary candidate for the Green Party. And before we went to the VT there, there was this discussion about where's the influence for this? Is it from the communities that are almost self-forming or politicians who are putting that fear that there is a problem and we need to note this? Ben, you were saying something there? Well, there's certainly ghettoization that's gone on in the United Kingdom. And I don't think anyone can argue it comes from the top down. It's very much been a case But if of you're being told that this is something that might be a problem for you, don't you start looking around for a problem? Uh, well, look, there's, there's no doubt that there are clearly areas of the, of the United Kingdom which have developed to be Muslim areas, indigenous British areas, Afro-Caribbean areas, and, and, and that demonstrates a failure um, of immigration policy to the United Kingdom and communities to integrate with each other because there really shouldn't be that level of separation. And a lot of research suggests that it is that level of separation that leads to um, the, the move towards radical Islam 
uh, the, the, the move towards people joining uh, up from, uh, to IS from the United Kingdom. And I think that is at the heart of the problem with immigration. It's not to do with race, it's not to do with jobs, it's not to do with economics, it's to do with integration. And so we need to have an economic policy and an, and an immigration policy in the UK that allows people to come into the United Kingdom at a rate where they can integrate with our society. And who decides that, Rashid? Well, I, I was going um, to say, to say that it's, it's you're, you're really kind of putting, from my side of the fence, you're, you're, you're putting the onus upon the victims here. And you're saying that the failure of immigrant communities to not integrate. And I'm thinking to myself, my, my dad came to this country from Barbados in the early 1960s. And he lived on a street called Summerlayton Road, which is like the main artery in Brixton for the black community, for the Caribbean community. And I lived on Summerlayton Road and my youngest son was born on Summerlayton Road. And I would not describe myself as being a person who didn't integrate. The fact that I have people from the Caribbean around me, so we have a certain cultural understanding. So we say, you know, we, we move with a certain type of energy. And to know that I can go down to my local store and I can get my Caribbean produce, I can get my yam, my plantings, and it's no problem. But yet still, I'll get on the, the tube and I'll go across London and I'll work and do what I have to do. But at the end of the day, I want to go back to my community to sit down amongst my people. Is, 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 that, is, is that such a bad thing? Uh, actually, I'm not saying it's the failure of immigrant communities, and I think very few people are saying that. I'm saying it's the failure of policymakers because the level of immigration has been so high that um, the natural formation is to, uh, therefore form these these ghettoized communities now but it's, but it's but not it, it, it's not it, good it, for even 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 though your choice of words like ghettoized communities it's like slow down i mean uh, from what i understand of the, of the word ghetto it was an area enclosed where they put jewish people back in the middle ages and they cut them off from the mainstream and now for you to use the word interchangeably between uh, 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 an african caribbean community a muslim community and the word ghettoization comes in I'm thinking, well, where does that place us, people who have come from these communities? Are we ghettoized people? Well, well, that's exactly the point. You see, the difference between the, the, the first ghettos and the ghettos that we're seeing, whether you consider them ghettos as w or whether you consider them naturally formed communities, that one comes from the top down and one comes from the bottom up. And what you're seeing at the moment is um, essentially a self-imposed disintegration of community cohesion. And I think it's perfectly understandable because of the rates of immigration. Uh, but it, it doesn't actually do any good for the country as a whole or for immigrant communities because there, there is going to be a point, of course, where those communities have to spread out, have to seek their fortune going to the rest of the country. Do white English people uh, live in ghettos? Do they have well, I, yeah, I think that they do. Yeah, I think you can look at examples in, in Bradford and Birmingham where you've got indigenous people where you can say this street is white British and this street is Muslim. But would you, but um, would you, would you use the term ghettoization to describe and I, 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 I think, I mean, I think the, I think on the semantics like this. is is Because we don't want to split hairs. We don't, we don't, we don't want to split hairs on this because it's something else that's fed into social media on a lot of this, where one ill-chosen word from a politician can be the beginning of the end. And as some of us know, the May 7 polls will be the first general election where it's gonna be fought completely across social media lines. And we're gonna take a look at what some people are saying online. And let's just start off with this first one here from Michael. And he's saying, look, I support Nigel Farage with what he said about immigrants coming into the country for free treatment. He tells it like it is. If you go abroad, you have to pay for treatment. So why not charge all foreigners here? And we were talking off, off the cuff about, you know, this sometimes being a dangerous thing to bring up. But it's things like these, Rashid, that sits badly with voters, with potential voters who feel, wait a second, are my needs being ignored because somebody else has come in here? Somebody else is taking what should be mine, however you phrase that. Yeah. Well, there was a very interesting documentary on a few weeks ago um, by the former head of the Equalities Commission. Um, entitled Things uh, We Don't Say About Race. Yes, Trevor truth. Phillips, that, that went that's well. That's right. And, <laughs> shameless self-publicist. And he may be a shameless self-publicist, but some of what he said was correct. And I think the main drive of what he said that was correct is that politicians have been become so spineless in this country that they haven't had 
um, the authority or the will or the bravery to engage with the issue of immigration. They've been worried about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. And therefore, there hasn't really been a coherent immigration policy in this country for the last 20 years. But now does that mean can, scapegoating is now If I can just finish the, finish the point. Acceptable. You've got Jack Straw as a Home Secretary and Theresa May as a, as a Home Secretary. These are very senior positions, people that have a, a good view of the country. They have underestimated immigration figures by, the, by a factor of 10. But that is, is a shocking that failure. because, Rashid, they were so quick to use it as a political tool, mentioning figures and mentioning uh, deadlines and mentioning targets, when actually that conversation could have been avoided briefly? Well, for you to, to say that the politicians were, were too spineless to take on board the issue of immigration, I mean, I, I do agree with you that politicians are quite spineless, but they're not that spineless to the point where being, they, they invert, vertebrate. They, I think the, the way this whole discussion is being skewered, even when Mr Farage put the issue forward at the, on the debate and he mentioned, you know, people who have HIV and they come over here to get treatment and health tourism, the fact that uh, a fellow panel member had to basically slap him down and the audience responded was for me that that really sent out a signal that as much as you know some some people on the real far right of the political spectrum want to really get this issue and get people really emotional about it i believe at the core of everyone in this country there's a decency and there's a, a human side which i think sometimes the politicians might just forget and we'll come back to that in a second because we still have some more of your messages there and just waiting for them to come up on the video wall because what we want to do is find out from you what your thoughts are on some of these issues that are making comments whether from guests like my esteemed ones here or out there in Facebook and Twitter land. And we have Anna who's saying, look, like it or not, we might get a Labour and SNP coalition. I'd much prefer that to a Conservative UKIP one, which would make a hellish five years. Ben, I really have to start with you on that. Very briefly, there have been meetings in the middle here about some overlapping policies, but two distinct parties, right? Uh, well, they are two distinct parties. I think there is almost no chance of a formal coalition taking place between the Conservative Party and UKIP. Um, and even if there was, you've got to remember that the likelihood is that UKIP will get um, considerably fewer than 10 MPs, which means that even if they were part of a formal coalition, and I think it's very unlikely, um, they, they wouldn't have you know, a significant voting block within Parliament. And I think actually the, the, the premise that this show set out is wrong. We haven't seen a shift to the right in the United Kingdom in terms of the new political parties. If you look at the SNP, Plaid Cymru and the Greens, these are radical left-wing parties. And you've only really got UKIP on, on the right and the Conservative Party is not really that much of a right-wing party anymore. Last word to you on this one, Rashid. How do we see this one panning out? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Well, well the country has definitely shifted to the right. Unfortunately, not towards the righteousness, just towards the right. UKIP have dragged the, the so whole So SNP debate. and Plaid Cymru and Greens, they're, they're right-wing new, new right parties. Absolutely, they're absolutely not in not. yet. That's were, no, but they're projected to have far more seats than, than UKIP. Far because, more because, seats. Because that, that, that would be a reaction to what the average person is looking at, saying, hold on a sec, what these people are talking about doesn't represent what but I'm that, voting but so for. So that's not a shift. All right, right guys, we're going to leave it there. Mm -hmm. And I hate to leave it when the discussion is getting so good, but that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. And of course, to my guests, Rashid and to Ben for sharing their views and very vocal comments. Join us next week for more feature, more analysis in the run-up to the British general election on May the 7th. Until next time. Guys, I'm always...